implementation. Um, and so um, the implementation piece is, is um, broken down into seven different working groups to focus on different components. Things like budget, finance, and reporting were required by the CSU system to be able to report a couple of times a year with respect to what we're doing with the money that we were given um, to support this polytechnic transition. We have a communications working group that's really all about brand and marketing and getting the word out about our institution. Curriculum and academic programs um, working group, which is really the, uh, a, a working group that I oversee also about what new academic programs are we offering. Enrollment and growth management, which is really about how do we target um, the increased enrollment that we're seeking, but how do we do it in a respectful and thoughtful way so as not to overwhelm um, the community in the area, but be an additive um, element to our community. So really thinking thoughtfully about what um, components need to be added both on and off campus to successfully infuse um, additional students as well as additional workforce. Um, the last three are facilities working groups, so that's all about infrastructure, housing, academic buildings, those sorts of things, which I'll talk a bit more about in a few. Um, inclusive student success and graduate initiative 2025, that's all about, it's really great and important to have students here and bring students here, but how do we ensure that they're successful as we're bringing them here? And Jen, then, yeah. If you have a PowerPoint, we're not seeing it. You're not. No, nope, you got to share a screen. Oh, you know what? Let me. Well, thank you. I, I didn't. I didn't go through much of the PowerPoint, so that's good. So thank you for stopping me. Sorry um, to interrupt. <laughs> no, you needed to interrupt. Hang on just a second. Hold on. I didn't. I really was only through like literally one slide, so that was good. And y'all are too polite. You should have interrupted me earlier. Here we go. All right. How about that? Got it? Can y'all see it now? Yes. Perfect. So this is all I was really talking through was this slide. It was really reflecting um, the different working groups um, that the Polytechnic Implementation um, team is all about. Um, and so that inclusive student success and then that technology and infrastructure group. So this is really the only slide that you missed. So nothing too, too big. Um, so I got um, a little bit of information ahead of the presentation with respect to some of the elements that you might be interested in and in learning a little bit more about. This slide reflects um, the different uh, curricular and academic programs that we're launching um, as it relates to Polytech. So if any of you have reviewed or, or heard a little bit about um, our Polytechnic prospectus, what we agreed to do um, was phase in new academic programs um, in the areas of engineering, technology, science, and applied science, and agreed to phase those in by 2023, 2026, and 2029, with the largest contingent of new programs coming by fall 2023. Now, please note, this is about, um, about polytechnic implementation is sort of meeting the requirements of the funding. It doesn't mean that we aren't able to add other programs that are outside of engineering, technology, science, and applied science, because we're able to do that too. But I'm really speaking to the, the pieces specific to polytech. So what we spent um, a considerable amount of effort and time this year is getting through the different levels and different processes of being able to effectively launch all of these new programs that you see listed um, by fall of 2023. And so I'm happy to report um, that we've successfully made it through both the, the system, um, the CSU system processes to launch these programs, as well as our internal processes. And really what that means is writing curriculum, proposing ideas, vetting it through the different um, faculty groups and curricular groups, those types of things. And what you can see is there's programs that um, are related to things like data science and engineering, marine biology, 
fire science, as well as some certificate programs as well. And what we really tried to do with the curriculum is align um, with where the, the big needs are um, in the state of California with respect to workforce and kind of big problem areas or areas um, of interest for the state. So things like energy and fire um, and technology, and then also really align with um, areas of strength at our institution and areas that the local um, environment really lends itself to. So things like marine biology, um, um, cannabis, those types of things as well. And so what you might not see in here and go, hmm, where are things like health programs or agriculture, things related to water? Um, those are some that have come up um, as being high interest and high need. And don't despair, um, there's a big push and we're gonna start working um, very hard this summer to be looking toward that 2026 timeframe. Um, and it's a by 2026, so it can happen earlier to really build out additional programs and things like masters of nursing, health navigation, um, uh, STEM education, um, different programs, agriculture, those types of things. These were really, um, when we looked at what we needed to launch to be in compliance with the agreements with the CSU, um, it was really to, to front load a bit on the engineering side in particular, because while we have an awesome engineering program, we really only have one. And so that's why we went forward with these. And go to the next slide. Um, so the other thing that um, is of interest, I think, is that um, we've worked really hard to secure and improve um, our relationship with the College of the Redwoods. And so making sure that we're in partnership, so we're not stepping on each other's toes, but rather in lockstep with one another um, so that students can start at the College of the Redwoods and then finish out at Cal Poly Humboldt. So we do quarterly summits um, with CR and work through different things like curricular pathways, career pathways, health programming, Two plus two really means first two years at CR, second two years, Cal Poly Humboldt. We've also worked to do tribal engagement. So going out and meeting with tribal leaders, I've done this actually personally with President Jackson and President Flamer to really build up um, those relationships and hear directly from the tribes about what's important to them with respect to what we're offering as an institution. Um, What's super exciting about this transition, and as I mentioned, that $25 million in ongoing funding to support academic program build out is we are doing a lot of hiring. Um, so this past academic year, um, we have done, we did solicitations for 16 um, tenure track um, positions specifically for the polytechnic new programs. Um, but I wanted to note that we did an overall total recruitment, um, and I don't know what the most recruitments in what any given year has ever been, but uh, 29 overall tenure track recruitments um, this past academic year. Some of those recruitments are still pending and interviews are happening right now, but we've really had an exciting um, array of faculty um, who are super interested in coming here. Lots of diverse folks from all over the the world and all over the, the United States. Um, and we are very much a destination campus at this point in time. One thing that we did um, that was a little bit different is we had, as you can imagine, trying to do 29 independent searches would be pretty tough. And so we had departments kind of get together and do some interdisciplinary approaches to hiring um, and work together on some recruitments. And that really yielded a more diverse pool and a more um, interesting pool with respect to people that had a variety of different skill sets. Um, we had interesting people that had data science and marine and ecology all wrapped up into one and were really excited that the, the interdisciplinarity that they offered was actually um, lauded and was inspiring to us. We also had 15 um, polytechnic specific staff positions filled. So thinking about 
sponsored programs and grants, thinking about more folks to support students and advising, um, those types of things. And I just wanted to note, um, it's, and I'll say this always, um, we aspire and we are committed to being a comprehensive polytechnic university. So infusing elements like traditional ecological knowledge, sustainability, arts, interdisciplinary collaboration, um, engineering and science are super important. Um, and that is important to our polytechnic identity, but it isn't the only thing that makes Cal Poly Humboldt um, an important institution for our students. Um, wanted to share with you enrollment and growth management. I, I suspect I'll field a few questions from this group about our growth and the students that we're um, attracting. So as you all may know, um, for the last several years, um, Humboldt State University was in a decline, an enrollment decline, some would even say a free fall. We were really struggling um, with the um, significant work of our Vice President of Enrollment Management, Jason Merriweather, as well as our Cal Poly Humboldt efforts. This has really turned around. We've, our enrollment has flattened and in fact is on the rise, which is incredible. We are um, actually um, rising and recruiting students at a higher level earlier than we thought. And so I put to you, you can see um, our confirmations to attend Cal Poly Humboldt are up actually 125% in the College of Natural Resources and Sciences among first year students, so freshman students. Kind of makes sense if you think about the polytechnic identity and the new academic programs that we're launching. But what you'll also see is already there's increased interest in confirmations in arts, humanities, and social sciences and professional studies as well. And that really aligns with the idea that getting our brand out there and who our institution is, is really good for all academic departments and all majors. Um, our transfer numbers are flat right now, um, which is okay, actually, that those um, in many institutions are well on the decline. A lot of that has to do with less students going to community colleges or sitting out um, during the pandemic time. Um, and so we're actually quite happy that our transfer numbers are flat. Um, and so that's, um, I, I actually think they'll go up just a little bit. Michelle, did you have a question? Yeah, um, so up, what is the baseline up from what? So, so from, from what's the baseline number of students overall? No, so you're up 125% in the natural resources from, we know that it's declined recently. So what's what's the baseline? Was it five years ago, last year, up from oh when? Oh, up from last year, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, up from last year, yeah. So it, it, it marks, it's, I think we're up overall amongst the three, it's I think about a 425 students. So to put that in context, um, is is important too because sometimes people go oh my gosh it's thousands and thousands of students and it's it's not and that's um confirmation obviously is different than they they've they're here you know and, and ready to go but it the, the numbers are looking positive so um the other thing i wanted to share just some other caveats as well is there's been um we've it's something that's been really important to me is thinking through sort of Cal Poly or not, but thinking through how we can leverage our summer session a little bit better. Um, as I understood from, from previous years, and, and clearly I've only been here during a pandemic, um, but what I had um, come to understand is that our summer session was pretty quiet um, and there had been moves, um, not a whole lot going on over the summer. Um, which to me felt like a missed opportunity. This is an incredibly beautiful and wonderful place over the summer. And if we get to start to be concerned about too many students during the fall and the spring, how do we help make summer an active time period as well? And so um, we, um, we actually launched an initiative to do um, free summer session for undergraduate students up to six units this summer. Um, to really reintroduce our summer session. And as you can imagine, that has been met with great excitement. Our summer session is full and jammed. Um, our summer session is super strategic and focused on closing equity gaps and offering courses where students traditionally struggle. 
Um, so summer session is up, it's robust. Um, super excited about that. Also working to invest what I call investing in year-round operations. So there've been lots of, it sounds like cuts and things where um, staff, many staff people um, were on 10 month contracts and that sort of thing and had summers off and really working to, and that was somewhat of a hardship for staff too. Um, so really um, reinvesting back into um, those year round operations. The other piece I'd say is um, really working with, um, we have a committee going called Welcome to Humboldt, thinking about all the staff and faculty recruitments we're doing and how do we help to support um, people um, entering into this community, right? And how do they get connected with neighbors? How do they get connected with um, a physician, right? Um, all those different, those pieces. That's also something that we're partnering with the city of Arcata and the city of Eureka about, and that's specific to partners actually. So it tends to be a little bit easier for people like myself who are talking to folks like you or going to meetings all the time, but for spouses and, and partners, sometimes it can be a little bit more difficult to connect in this community. So really trying to make efforts to, to welcome in everybody. Um, housing and infrastructure updates. I know this is probably a, a hot topic that, that folks are interested in. Um, I could probably spend an hour or two hours um, giving you all an update on that. And I might suggest, I suspect this group is pretty interested in that. Um, maybe sometime in the fall, having Mike Fisher, who's our Associate Vice President of Facilities, and Eric Griggs, who's the Dean of Natural Resources and Sciences, come and talk with you about all of our infrastructure projects in more depth. They're co-leading the facilities working group. But I want to just give you a couple of updates, you know, with all of the infrastructure projects, both housing as well as academic programs, it requires us to do a pretty comprehensive facilities plan for the institution um, and then start thinking through different programming of different buildings. We're gonna have a new engineering and technology building. And so the first step is to try to figure out what needs to get programmed within that building and then put the feasibility study out and start to work toward um, kind of the different plans forward um, to put that out for bid and, and start looking um, toward the future for future construction in those pieces. Um, microgrid and sustainability complex. So that was one of the pieces that was um, funded actually in that 433 million was an acknowledgement of our expertise in energy um, and one in providing us funding to support a, a microgrid, um, microgrid project um, essentially because uh, essentially a, a, a project just to be able to support Cali, Cal Poly Humboldt you know if we're impacted by power outages fires that sort of stuff how do we have our own microgrid to be able to support operations of the institution as well to educate students on on those pieces as well um let's see here um housing so this is one i know that um that y'all are probably pretty interested in the, the craftsman housing complex so that, um, that project is underway with respect to um, design, build competition. The RFP um, is out in all of those pieces. Um, but I know often people wanna know like when, when are shovels in the ground? Um, when is the project projected to be completed and how many beds? So I did pop this up for you and I'm happy to forward the slides to Kim or whoever if y'all are interested in this more detailed information. But essentially, Craftsman is um, um, projected to be completed in January of 2025 and should yield about 800 beds. There are also two other student housing complex um, housing projects um, that are um, being phased in after the Craftsman project on campus. And those um, have a 2026 and then 2028 um, completion. Um, timeframes um, that would yield 1,250 additional beds. I did wanna put in there in the middle there, you know, there's a campus apartments demo. If you've ever seen the campus apartments, they're in pretty rough shape. And those are things that we'd like to take offline. Um, and so we would actually look to, to demolish those actually in August of 2026. And so that would um, cause us to reduce about 210 beds. So if you do the math, we're looking at about 1,850 additional 
beds um, in the works right now. Um, what I imagine people go is, oh my goodness, if you have a goal to double enrollment in seven years, how, how are we going to hit the sweet spot with being able to, to house our students? And that um, will happen through a variety of different um, measures. One is robust summer session. One is some online components. One is we're actually underutilizing um, housing right now. We've been under enrolled, so we're not at capacity quite yet. And we're also seeking um, relationships and partnerships with um, housing and apartment um, complexes and such in the community as well. So there's a lot of efforts going on to ensure that there's access to housing for our students, as well as our faculty and our staff. Um, this is I guess this is pretty much the same, but we're also looking at things like um, land, acquisition, land acquisition opportunities um, for future housing, academic and technical facilities. Um, and again, the, uh, yeah, this is a little bit of a repeat of the previous, but the comprehensive facilities plan should be completed in fall 2023. And that would be probably an interesting thing um, to put out to, to you all and others to kind of see what the more holistic picture of what the campus um, is gonna look like. And the last thing I did, did wanna share with you and, and um, is about brand and marketing. So one thing that we've been super um, interested in and felt was really important is to really take a look at how, um, how Cal Poly Humboldt is received um, by prospective students, alumni, parents, um, community members as well, and really um, uh, engage in a, in a rebranding opportunity here with our name change. Um, it does require us to change everything from the signs outside the campus to our web pages to my business card to everything. And so it was a real opportunity to really take a look at um, what is is there a way to reintroduce the institution and its strengths to prospective students and community members? So I've been working with Simpson Scarborough and partnering with them to do that rebranding work. Sometimes people ask, well, what about the mascot? And people have a lot of really strong opinions about the mascot, positive, negative, or somewhere in between. And that's something that has come up as well and probably will be looked at. I, have absolutely no idea if it would stay the same or be different, but I know that that's something that comes up for folks as um, something that would be important to, to take a look at at some point. So I will take a look at the chat. Um, I always like to pose questions back to you all as well. Um, and so you can answer them or not. Um, I imagine you have questions, but I always like to understand from the audience um, what y'all are excited about with regard to Cal Poly Humboldt, um, what you might be nervous about. And then this, this group represents a lot of wisdom and resources. And um, I love to, to garner that wisdom and be able to take it back to our leadership team to, to be able to leverage um, the information and the, the great strengths that you all have. So I'm really open to hearing all of that stuff if you're willing to offer. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I'm going to take a look at the chat and see what questions I may have missed or if people want to raise their hand, but I can go down the, the list here. So I see Jane's question, at what rate do you anticipate enrollment to increase over the next five years or so? Do you know the number of students anticipated for fall 2022? Um, so we were down to about 56, 5,700 students. And so looking um, right now, I think to be up about 400, 450, um, which again, we thought this year would just flatten. Um, and what's happening is we're starting to, to, to go on the increase about a year earlier than we anticipated. And so when we talk about this double in enrollment in seven years, um, that's an estimated guess and a target. Um, and so I'm, I'm, in the Polytechnic prospectus um, that you can get on the, the Polytech page, it kind of goes year by year, those increases. I anticipate a bigger increase to come fall 2023, and that's when all of those new programs launch. So we're already seeing, I think, some of what's happened in this first year is that students are, um, we're fielding requests all the time, can I come to Humboldt now and jump into the new engineering program 
when it launches in 2023. So basically, can I take my GE courses and then go over into the engineering program and get there a year early? So we are getting that interest um, already, which is pretty cool. Um, how much- so You have plenty of housing for them right now because you have excess housing to, to begin with, right? We do, although, yeah, we do have, we do. We haven't been full for a little while. Um, yeah. yeah. So it won't push the housing market right away. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> I worry, to be perfectly honest with you, I worry even a bit more about our um, staff and our faculty as we're bringing, yeah. and that's the yeah. part that I'm most worried yeah. about, to be perfectly honest with you. Yeah, it's the staff, it's the, the professors. Right. Yeah. And so we've, we've done some work with different um, realtors and property, property managers and stuff that are um, very interested in working with, with Cal Poly Humboldt um, because they want to work with um, faculty and staff and try to offer those opportunities and looking at things like master leases and, and different things to really be able to offer those opportunities. And the good thing too, is some of our hiring, um, not all of it by any means, but there have um, been some opportunities where um, local lecturers, so part-time faculty, um, have um, entered into these tenure track searches and 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 um, earned the tenure track position so that some of the folks are already local. There's also a fair number of people, at least a handful that I can think of, that have some local connections. So they had gone here before, they have a family member, they have some um, relationship to the area and so have local connections, I think that can help to facilitate them as they um, come into the community. So I think that that's, that's great. So hearing more and more about that. And again, that's why we have those efforts going with sort of the welcome to Humboldt, how do we connect people and being really thoughtful about that. Um, and also doing the recruitment of faculty um, a year ahead of when we're launching the program. So if we run into barriers with things like housing or barriers with recruitment, um, those types of things that we can work through that um, before it's, you know, becomes too problematic. Um, how much housing for how many students are you planning to house on campus? Well, right now we're looking um, we try to, I think our goal is, is to house 4,000-ish, um, so like half on campus, half, half off campus. That's sort of the overall arching goal with certainly understanding that first and second year students tend to do a little bit better um, when they um, have on-campus or um, on-campus arrangements. So that's mm -hmm. really the goal there. Um, Slides, let's see, do you anticipate buying land in the gateway area? I am not sure about that. I don't know that um, that is anything that's on our radar at this point in time. So I don't think so. Um, C CPH, so Cal Poly Humboldt purchased Stewart School in Arcata. So um, I don't, I, I'm not aware of, of any of those land acquisitions at this point in time. It's not to say that they're, we're certainly looking at and reviewing different opportunities for, for land acquisitions, but, but not quite yet. Do you know where the microgrid might be installed? So they're reviewing different sites um, for that. So in fact, I was just meeting with uh, Dr. Peter Alston, who's engaged in that project, as well as Dr. Um, Arnie Jacobson. And so they're looking at a couple of different sites and locations um, on that. So I'm not quite sure yet. That's still, um, you know, being taken a look at. So I don't know quite yet. Some schools only plan for housing for freshmen, upper class are housed. The community is just the plan for Cal Poly Humboldt. Um, so more of the, the greater focus is on that first and second year housing on campus, but there are opportunities for upperclassmen to be housed um, on campus as well. Um, so it's both, but we definitely prioritize the, the first and second year students, just because that tends to be um, more of a retention metric for those first and second year students. Um, I'm gonna, so Jane, I don't know your question, how can we assist Cal Poly Humboldt with realizing its plans? And so I'd pitch that back to you because I'd love to understand some of the 
the strengths and connections that you all have um, that could help to support, um, you know, as we make these transitions. So I might pitch that question back to you. Because <laughs> I don't know. I mean, you know, I think that what do you are you interested in having community members be ad hoc members of your planning committees, for example? Do you have any community members? Or are they all faculty? Oh, no, absolutely. Absolutely. We absolutely um, love to have community members. Um, so 100% if folks are interested in engaging, um, even the working groups that I mentioned, for example, the facilities working group, there's actually five subgroups to that working group because there's one that's housing, one that's academic programs. There's one that's they call they're very proud of their name. It's called Team Domino, but it's essentially the impact of every time you build or stand up a program or change a space and it's going to impact another program right so how do you think collectively and holistically about space and to the point somebody said parking parking is 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 in, incorporated into all of our planning so we're not just putting up a building and not thinking about parking parking is part of that that um that planning process too so if we're putting up any sort of building it's also inclusive of parking because we don't want to negatively impact um that piece so if we wanted to be engaged with a committee how do we go about saying so <laughs> just talk to me or sheree oh, okay. but uh, you're talking to me so you, you're welcome to to reach out to me and let me know so okay. do yeah. you have particular areas where you would like us to be engaged that would be helpful I think it's a matter of what your interest is and what you think you could lend to to a group. So I would imagine things like facilities and uh, infrastructure and technology and those types of things, but um, would be helpful. But I also think about um, academic programs, where, you know, really anything that speaks to you. I'm happy to to welcome y'all in. So um, we'll probably go on a little bit of a soft hiatus over the summer. Um, the leadership of the different working groups will still meet, but there is a lot of um, the working groups. There are a lot of faculty engaged by design, and so faculty are off over the summer. So probably will be a little lighter over the summer in some of that. But Julie, have your hand up. Yeah, I just want to say that as the obvious that um, it's important for all of us to support education in general. And to do that at every opportunity right now in Arcata, there are issues ongoing about housing where we can support increased housing in general. Uh, we've protected the ag lands, we've protected the forest in partnership with HSU, and we need to continue that partnership and do what we can instead of getting in the way. We want, I think we want our young people to have an opportunity to be educated and people somehow forget that. So that's my input on that. Well, I appreciate you saying that, thank you. Well, and we want them to have opportunities to stay here. Um, and, and if we're relying on housing for third and fourth year students or graduate students, we have to figure out how to accommodate that as well. Whether ADUs that are being uh, created could become available and not just for fathers-in-law and mothers-in-law and things like that, because that's a program that could possibly assist, so. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's a couple other questions in the chat. One says, have you been working with the county and city government to deal with the lack of medical and dental care in the area? Right, um, good point. Yeah, so so yes. Um, so one thing I'll share with you is um, that is a huge priority for me. That That's actually a priority I wish I could have started working on the second I got to the area, but then the, um, the polytechnic transformation the resources to support that transition came forward. And then that that kind of, um, you know, got out in front. And so we needed to really work on getting that board um, of trustees approval, the plans to launch all these academic programs, all this infrastructure, all those pieces. And health programs are definitely a part of Polytechnic. They really fit into the applied sciences piece. Um, we're really strong in the applied sciences piece. Um, but health is is my background in many ways, and in doing a lot of that work is an area of expertise of mine. So it's something I've been like chomping at the bit um, to engage in. So we're engaged in lots of different places, right? In this board and that board, um, but not more in a collective, holistic way um, with the city and county. And that's something that we're going to really um, 
seek to understand all of the different groups that are working on these efforts and how can we collectively at Cal Poly Humboldt start to really get into and try to be a resource to address these issues um, from a workforce standpoint, from a recruitment standpoint, et cetera. So be a good partner. So uh, it, particularly if anybody has strong interest or uh, in that piece, um, that's sort of a, a side thing that um, is gonna get going this summer um, now that I have a little bit more capacity, but that's a, that's a big one. Um, and I experienced that myself as being, you know, just shy of two years in the community, but it was heck to, to get in and, and get a dentist and, and a physician and all those things. So. Right. It's tough. Yeah. Um, there, have been, there have been issues raised about infrastructure and how Cal Poly is going to uh, help the city of Arcata address the additional infrastructure potentially needed to accommodate the additional students and, and staff and so forth, the, the rise in population. I'm not sure I'm understanding your question. How, so- Wastewater what? treatment. Oh, um, yeah. Things like that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we're, I think we have good relationships with city and county governments and the different, you know, in Arcata and Eureka and, and all these places. And I think that we've, we've, you know, we're happy to be good partners in those, in those ways, I think. Um, uh, Jane, I want to, I'm trying to understand your, your question about uh, increasing postgraduate programs. What are you thinking about in particular? Well, masters, PhDs, things like that. Is that part of the plan to increase the number and degrees of those? Yeah, so, so for master's programs, um, yes. Um, master's programs really where um, my focus um, overseeing the academics is really to help support us to align a bit better with uh, um, the workforce gaps in the areas in which um, their sort of professional master's degree programs. So where there's workforce gaps. So one example of that would be a master's in nursing. That's a big priority um, that, that is gonna go forward here pretty soon, um, hopefully in the 2026 timeframe. But areas, we have a master's in engineering actually that's gonna launch in 2023 that'll allow, um, that, that's an incredible sort of pathway to management or leadership in the field of engineering. Um, I'd love us to get to at some point a master's in cybersecurity, um, those types of things, but places that are aligned um, very much with workforce, I think more health degrees as well. I think the PhD um, will eventually happen. That's a, a question that has been called in the CSU system more broadly um, and looking at ways to, um, to do more um, in the PhD space. And so there's a little bit of a what are our guardrails around that as a system? And, and what I'm hearing much more is a lot about um, professional degrees um, and looking forward to doing more um, PhD programs in that way. But, um, and I know we had some interest in that space, but we're asked to pause just a little bit and focus on the polytechnic designation first before we started going after PhD programs, which I, I agree with. It's a Launching 12 new academic programs by 2023 is a Herculean effort. So um, that'll be kind of next phase. Yeah. Um, will this new focus on summer session open up to the over 60 program access to summer classes? Um, so, so help me understand. So meaning if, so, people over 60 can audit classes or get into classes if there's room. Is that, is that what you're asking? It is? Yeah, I think that's what the question is, yeah. Yeah, and that currently the summer session's not open to that program. Has it ever been? Do you know? I have no idea. I just happened to be interested and you know, okay. found that to be true, so. Okay, no, that's a good question. Um, summer session, it, it's, it, it's a different, well, it, I'm just trying to figure out how much to bore you with, with the, the, the backside of things, but um, that's a good question. Um, 
summer session is a little bit structured a little bit differently um, than fall and spring. And that really shouldn't matter to anybody. If somebody wants to take a summer class or a fall or spring class, they should be able to do that. So let me let me check on that because I didn't actually know that it wasn't open. Um, the the uh, summer classes have been open to the Ali community. Okay. So if you're an Ali member, then you should be able to get into it. And Julie, you're raising your hand. Yes, um, you asked for input, so I'm taking advantage of this. Um, thanks for all the work you're doing right now. That's really impressive. And I also want to add a thanks to somebody who's not, I don't think, even in the group, is the people who just gave $2 million to the library. Right. I thought that, and that that's in line with the comments I wanted to make. I'm a Humboldt graduate, and I studied German, French, English. And at the time, to get a degree at Humboldt, you had to take a class in every single discipline. <laughs> which at the time I found fairly troublesome and annoying because I had to take tennis and then I had to take geology and chemistry and all kinds of things. And of course, as I got older, I realized the tremendous advantage that was. So part of my input is about the importance of the broad liberal arts education that I think will save the planet. One and two. In that interest, um, I met with recently with the new uh, dean of arts and humanities and somebody from the foundation, and we were just chatting. and And the question came up: How many people are really involved in the arts in Humboldt County? So I made a list of everybody I could think of, and then I sent it to a few people and asked them to add to the list. And it, I have a list of uh, three hundred and fifty individuals which is not complete by any stretch, but these are only people who work in the arts. They're not people like me who play my violin every day with different people. I don't do it for my income. These are people who've been largely uh, either educated in Humboldt or influenced by Humboldt who are sustaining the arts in our community. And I bring it up because lots of times people in the sciences and math don't always make the connection of that importance. And there are actually scientific studies that show that students who study art and music, if they spend part of the time in art music classes and not entirely in science and math, actually do better. And so I just did every opportunity, I like to remind people of this fact. So not only does it make us healthier, better people, it actually improves how our brains work. So that's the end of my infomercial. <laughs> and thank you for listening to it. I appreciate your infomercial. You know, it's interesting. So one thing that I noted coming, it's interesting because I come from Colorado. I was in Colorado for many years and some things are the same with respect to higher ed and some are different. Um, one thing that is different in California is the number of required um, general education courses. Like it's a lot, the units required um, are higher. Um, so one could say, well, that's good because it's going to force to what you're saying, like a music course, a humanities course, science, like all this, this variety. Um, and then when you pair that with Humboldt, who, um, in my experience with the majors has put forth a ton of required courses to complete a major, there's no flexibility left for people to pick <laughs> anything that could be potentially of interest. So two things are happening. There's been some work um, at the state level to reduce slightly the required GE, so general education. Um, and then there's an effort in academic affairs now for curricular redesign um, to add more flexibility and say like, where's the sweet spot with respect to how many courses and what to get, uh, you know, a degree in music or a degree in physics, like it's too much. There's no flexibility. And what's happened is to your point, students aren't able to be able to pick into some electives. What's also happened is when you have transfer students or you have students who've changed their major a few times, it creates a barrier for them. And so we're really, um, I'm 100% uh, on your team, Julie, because um, I want more flexibility for our students to be able to do those things. And when I hear sometimes people go, well, you know, uh, um, the interdisciplinarity piece and the value of arts um, in science is so important to us being a comprehensive polytechnic and um, you'll see it um, coming forward. Um, you just will, because that's, that's 
inherently in the middle of what our goals are. So I appreciate you saying that and we're on the same page. I just, I'll I, just realized, I just realized I have one other thought uh, because I attend a workshop at Humboldt every summer. It's mm -hmm. called the Chamber Music Workshop. Mm -hmm. And I think it's going to be musicians. Well, they are musicians. They're really extraordinary musicians. But when I sit at the table eating with them, it turns out they're all scientists and math brains. And yep. they're actually a good resource for you to come up maybe and uh, say something during that workshop about what's going on because they are great resources for drawing students in. They're the best brainy people in the, in the nation who come and play music for the heck of it. So they're a great resource too. Awesome, thank you. Anything else? Do y'all have words of wisdom for me? What else do I need to know? Julie shared some words of wisdom. Who else? This is this is Tom Boyer. Uh, um, McKinleyville has been absent in all your conversations, and it's important. It's right next door. Yeah, I I, I agree with you totally. Um, yeah, we we do connect with McKinleyville and the Chamber of Commerce and um, some of the different chamber meetings and such. You're right. I think. Um, our, I think we've been most connected with Arcata and Eureka, but um, but yeah, we are connected with McKinleyville. I'd say probably Trinidad a little bit less. So although we do have a, a bit of a footprint in Trinidad, but you're hundred percent right, Tom. So thanks for saying that. And I'd certainly vote for making sure you have flexibility in students being able to take different kinds of courses because some of the foundation of creativity is being able to take a concept from one field and apply it to another where nobody's thought of applying it before and you can't do that if you don't have a range of knowledge in a variety of different areas and and i found that really mattered in my undergraduate taking it on to subsequent work gives you a intellectual flexibility that you otherwise wouldn't have and then opens up options in case you decide oops this isn't where i want to be and if you don't have any exposure to other areas then you aren't going to know that those are those might be interesting to you so being forced to take <laughs> areas outside your field is really healthy for, for young people. Absolutely. That's well said. Definitely. And I love the idea of the summer sessions where they can take courses. They can go and experiment and try something different. Yeah. Um, and, and I would also encourage you to seek out former faculty or professionals in the community for mentoring because there are a lot of us. And a lot of people, even not from this area, who've come and retired here um, for obvious reasons. <laughs> and, and they can help students get acclimated and help faculty, new faculty spouses. I'm not gonna say wives because it could be the other way around, um, get integrated into the community. And I think that would be also very valuable. So whether you have get togethers for faculty spouses where they can meet community members, not just students, but, but new staff, new faculty members, because they need to get integrated. We have lost people in the past because their spouses either couldn't find jobs or felt socially isolated. And we need to find ways to break down those barriers. And this is a very open community. We have a zillion nonprofits people can get you know, engaged in, but people, you need somebody like you have a new congressperson they get you know taken around and introduced and everybody gets together um we need to consider things like that in order to keep retention of our faculty and staff so thank you anybody Absolutely. else have any questions this is your chance go for it <laughs> All right. Yes, Dave. I actually, Dixie. I I'd like to say thank you very much to Jen and to all of you who have offered uh, your support and your ideas. I'm retired. I came up here. I have a PhD in clinical psychology, uh, and I love taking the extended ed courses at the 
university. I can take everything that I never could take when I was at the university studying intensely for a PhD. So I find it very interesting to be there on campus and to watch this change. And I'll be happy to volunteer on, in any area uh, where I might be of service. And thank you very much, Jen. It was very informative. That's great, Dixie. Thank you so much for that. that um, and that I'm, awesome. I'm from Colorado too. Are you really? That's I, awesome. I did my undergraduate degree at Fort Collins. Oh, nice. The other CSU. Yes. Yes. <laughs> many, many years ago. Very um, cool. And, and I loved being able to take things out of my area. I loved philosophy, even though I was a psychology major, I could take a lot of philosophy classes and I appreciated that. And I do it now at HSU, so, or Cal Poly. I know, it's hard to remember. Thank you, Thank you very much. And Kay, you have a question? Well, it's not really a question, but it's a suggestion, I guess. I've been emailing with a couple in Washington state and they were very upset when they heard that uh, HSU was going Cal Poly. And they were so afraid that the arts were going to be lost and even made the comment, well, they were going to quit donating, which upset me terribly. <laughs> and so I have been clipping all the, um, out of the urge in the paper and everything that I can find and sending them about all the local, um, uh, events that the Cal Poly people have been engaging in on the theater and the, the musical things and so forth, trying to convince them that no, we're not dropping the arts. But I think it would be um, good to include that in all of your PR work when you're you're doing your um, outreach that you let people know who, because they were from the John Van Duzer mm -hmm. era and to let them know that that's not going away. And the, the other uh, speakers have made good points about the broad education and how there is transference from one area of your life to the others. So and people end up in far different uh, uh, professions even. Um, the gentleman was um, um, stagecraft and he ended up being a salesperson for doing the education for the sales staff for Pfizer pharmaceuticals, which never would have been predicted when he was studying uh, drama and theater at uh, HSU then. So anyway, that's my comment. Don't forget to promote that in your outreach as well. And no, Center Arts, which has been reinstated. Right. Yeah, that's really important. And just to say, just to share this last round of recruitments that we did, um, we're hiring for positions in film, art, music, um, et cetera. And so those are prominent um, positions that are being hired for. And again, several um, positions in art again this forthcoming year. Um, so to say that, and then also pointing toward um, the, the, the bump in confirmations, particularly for the College of Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences. So there's an investment happening in the arts, um, despite this potential fear of Polytechnic means that we don't care about the arts, which is not true. Right. So but just don't forget to promote it. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Michelle, did you want to? Um, you kindly put your hand up. <laughs> so. Yeah, I, I'm not really sure how to ask this, so I'll I'll blunder along here. Um, my sense of um, that uh, over the last number of years, there's been kind of a a heavy mood, if you will, of, of um, you know, motivation at the university in terms of uh, staffing and faculty, folks enjoying their jobs, feeling invigorated that that, that had, had kind of lessened. And so I'm curious with this new uh, opportunity, what is the mood? Are people engaged? Are they scared? Um, you know, do they just want to do their time and get their retirement? Or are they like reinvigorated to really engage? So, yeah, that's a good question. Good question. 
Yeah, I would say for the most part, I'd say that most people that this has been a really unifying um, thing to around this polytechnic transformation, particularly as people are, are reassured through um, our identity and budget support, et cetera, that again, back to the piece about arts, humanities, social sciences, education, all of those pieces, um, that it isn't being left behind, but rather that it's, it's being brought along and will elevate as well. But it's been very unifying for the institution because it's been something that we can come together on and really um, work toward. Humboldt was struggling. The enrollment was really, um, really underwater. And this um, was something that we came together on, worked together on, got a huge investment from the state and have all gotten on the same side of things and worked toward a goal. And it's, it's showing itself. And so I think that it, this is the first time in many years where we've not had to do budget reductions. And I'm not talking about because we got an investment from the state. We had worked through our budget reductions aside from the investment from the state because that polytechnic money was really for infrastructure and new programs. We had to get ourselves right from a budget standpoint aside from that. So this is the first year we're looking forward and lots of building and investing in innovation. There's certainly a few folks here, here and there that are like, oof, if it's not the old way, I don't want to do it. And, and that's okay. We can support them in moving kind of forward and, and finding a different path for them. But I'd say for the mm-hmm. most part, um, it is a really positive thing. And hopefully we'll find our way out of the pandemic here eventually. And, you know, it's the campus is more alive and invigorated. There are more events and center arts and different things. Commencement is on Saturday. I mean, so it, it's, it's, it's a pretty exciting time. So I think it's moving in the right direction. Are there any other questions? Yeah, this is uh, Lawrence Lowry. I don't have video, but I just uh, thought I'd make a comment about uh, diversification of uh, courses. I enjoyed that when I was in school 50 years ago, but uh, there is a counter argument these days. I would think that uh, when you're paying $500 or $1,000 per course, you'd want to focus that on the ones that have market value through their certification. And you could do your diversification through uh, other resources that are easily available on the internet and the library and other ways. So I don't know how the students these days feel about that, but uh, I would think they might be looking at that. I think one thing with our our polytechnic plan and the launch of our new academic programs, as well as some of the work we've been doing with existing programs is really to help create pathways or identify pathways into career and align with where workforce gaps are. But even for um, existing programs, like somebody was sharing about how much they loved, maybe a couple of people about philosophy courses. And we have a great philosophy program and some people major Mm -hmm. in philosophy and there's great value in that degree. Um, our students very much need to understand what's their pathway to a career with a philosophy degree. And there are great pathways, but spelling those out and identifying what they are um, to support um, kind of students' future success. But definitely in our new programs, really aligning with where the priorities of the state, where the gaps in the workforce, that's really been attractive to students going forward. So, yeah. Good. Any other comments or questions? We have people who've been very happy to have you here. I'm very happy to have you here. You've done a magnificent job in putting together the planning that has landed the money (laughs) from the state and landed the certification as a Cal Poly. So I want to congratulate you personally for heading this up. And you've been a gift to the university. Well, I mean, it's not that they aren't paying you, but... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you really have into the community. So I want to thank you very much for updating us and want to let every, and, and I'm sure everybody else is the same way. It's been wonderful. And I want to remind you that next week we're going to be talking about community and innovation at the Cal Poly Humboldt Library with the Dean, Cyril Oberlander. And He's going to talk about all the new transformational activities they, and, and, and facilities they've created there and 
invite you to come and visit. I think he's going to give you a video tour. He said he was a little worried about making everybody nauseous <laughs> by walking through the library and showing you. So I don't know how he's resolved that, but we're looking forward to seeing you again. And thank you so much for coming today. We look forward and, and feel free to contact Jen. She's very accessible um, when she's not trying to walk her dogs and keep them out of mischief. Um, she's she's a delight so <laughs> <laughs> we look forward to seeing you again thanks so much thank you good to see everybody have a good one thanks, thanks everybody thank you